Please, everyone, stand to your feet. Shirley Chisholm made a run for the presidency in, 19, in the 1970s, and in 1984 and 88, Reverend Jesse ran, and we uh, dumbed his theme, dubbed his theme, Run, Jesse, Run. Uh, Al Sharpton gave it a shot, and we didn't see Barack Obama come, and we declared that it would never happen. So in 1992, someone from Hope, Arkansas, uh, became president of the United States, and we just dubbed him at that time the first black president of the United States. Please receive the Honorable William Jefferson, Bill Clinton. Give God praise for Lady Hillary Clinton here as well. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop. Reverend Smith, Mrs. Ellis, members of Aretha's family for giving Hillary and me a chance to show up and just say, we started out not as the president, the first lady, the senator, the secretary of state. We started out as like Aretha groupies or something. I mean, you know, she was only about um, four years older than me, five years older than Hillary. So when we were getting out of college, it was when she finally got her big breakthroughs. It's one thing I want to say to all the young people in the audience. Yes, yeah, she had the voice of a generation, maybe the voice of a century. Yes, she was born into a musical culture. Yes, she sat on the steps in her home and listened to Art Tatum, maybe the greatest jazz pianist who ever lived, play. But she also worked for years, I mean years springing out of the church and the gospel music to the R&B clubs, the jazz clubs, the places where soul was being born, the places where rock and roll was being played. When nobody was paying particular attention, I went back and reread her autobiography the other day and I said, oh my God, when she was making her way, she actually opened a jazz club for John Coltrane, and he did a set after her. Why am I saying this? This woman got us all here in these seats today, right? Not because she had this breathtaking talent, which she did, not because she grew up, as Attorney General Holder said, at least a princess of soul because of her father, her mother, her relatives, but because she lived with courage, not without fear, but overcoming her fears. She lived with faith, not without failure, but overcoming her failures. She lived with power, not without weakness, but overcoming her weaknesses. I just loved her. So I started off as a groupie. And then I said, oh my God, this woman who has sung for America when Dr. King was killed. You know, all these political conventions, including mine, 
at, at least President Obama in my inauguration ceremonies and various things. And I even talked her into coming to the Rose Garden to sing for the Emperor and Empress of Japan. Thought it might loosen them up a little, you know, it'd be good. Okay, so I figured out, I think, that the secret of her greatness was she took this massive talent and this perfect culture that raised her and decided to be the composer of her own life song. And <laughs> what a song it turned out to be. I want to say, I hope God will forgive me, but I was so glad when I got here, and I hope you will forgive me, when the casket was still open because I said, I wonder what my friends got on today. I said, I want to, I want to see what the girl is carrying out. One last thing. For all the wonderful things Aretha did for me, all the great events she appeared at, my most enduring memory of her was almost happenstance, for I was there at what turned out to be the last public singing she ever did at Elton John's aid benefit last year in the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in Harlem, just a couple of blocks from my office. So Elton John and I had done a lot of work together for a long time on AIDS, and he asked me to come. I showed up, and I said, well, you know, and he said, Aretha's the, the talent, so I showed up a little early. <laughs> and I was like a great school kid. Here I am, you know, old gray-haired guy. So sure enough, she heard I was there, and she summoned me back. And she's sitting there, I mean, obviously desperately ill, gaunt. She stood right up and said, how you doing, baby? I said, well, I'm doing, I'm doing better now. And she said, she said, well, look at me. I finally got thin again. I took a lot of guts to say that. And then she went out into this setting. And all these people who loved her and were awestruck and said, can you believe she showed up? And she sang not one song, not two songs, not three songs. She had them bring a chair out, and she sang for 45 straight minutes. That's what I want to say to the young people here, the people who may not even know the names of the people who were influences on her. I went back and was literally awestruck reading her autobiography and how generous she was to call the names of dozens of gospel singers and musicians of our of soul singers that most people don't know. And to say they're underappreciated. She kept filling out her life. But I'll never forget her. She stood up singing in that cathedral when she could. She sat down when she got tired. 
She even went over and played one song on the piano just to make sure none of us forgot that she was real good at that. So our friends, our family member, our mother, our grandmother, our aunt, our whatever, she did as she dominated our ups and downs and joys and heartbreaks when we started off listening to her first on the radio right end of buying the records. Then you got tapes. You had to have a tape deck. The CDs, then you had to have a CD player. Now all you need to do is carry one of these little phones around. If you're as ancient as I am, it seems incredible, all the music in the world right here. But, She did this great thing, knowing she could not live long. And she even told the audience that that day she had gotten a good medical report. I have no idea if it's true or not, because it was after I left her. But I know one thing, she wanted them to sit back, relax, feel good, and listen to her sing and not worry about how long she was going to live. Now, we're living in a time where a lot of the virtues I just described to you are not very much in fashion. She cared about broken people. She cared about people who were disappointed. She cared about people who didn't quite succeed as much as she did. She wrote about them all in her book. And I can tell you, I've had an editor. Her editor was eating on her. Aretha, leave these people's names out. Nobody knows who they are. I do. And if they don't know who they are, they should have. So, this is what I think you should remember in this time about this magnificent woman. She worked her can off to get where she was. She took the gifts God gave her and she kept getting a little bigger every day. So, It's the key to freedom. God bless you, Aretha. We love you. The one and only president, the president of the United States, President William Jefferson Clinton.